Let's go. I'm here with Ryan, my friend of a long time. We met through meditation and here we, we met through meditation. We we deepened our relationship through psychedelics and here we are after four years. Um, here we are. So I'm going to explain a little bit of what, what is this podcast, The Maverick Experience. It's um, I've been recording videos in Portuguese for three years and three or more four probably yeah three years or three years and a half and now I'm starting this journey of speaking English and inviting my friends who also are English speakers to talk about psychedelics and the reason why it's called the Maverick Experience is because I decided that each uh, podcast I'm going to be under the influence of a substance no one knows what it is it can be caffeine or it can be other stuff it can be psychedelics um but let's talk about you ryan you want to introduce yourself and talk a little bit maybe about your how you started into the the psychedelic journey i think that's how we connected mm -hmm. and maybe you can introduce yourself from there sure um yeah what an experience that was uh i guess if we rewind right before we met I had my first psychedelic experience and it was with uh, ayahuasca and uh, 5-MeO-DMT. Um, so my first experience with it, I dove right in. And like I like I do with, with uh, most things, but um, it was pretty profound. And then um, we, you know, we connected on that, I guess about a year later. And uh, my, my background really, uh, I, I mean, I've been in tech for 20 years, uh, always interested or since then in the uh, in psychedelics and psychedelic nature. And even from a, um, a policy standpoint, uh, researching maps and just, you know, the, the application of it for, for veterans. I'm also a veteran. So yeah, MDMA and um, uh, and, and ketamine as as uh, treatment for PTSD. Um and not myself, but just uh, just interested in it as a, as a topic because of uh, the work I do with veterans. Um, yeah. Besides that, uh, I guess my my spiritual journey really kicked off around the same time, and, and that's how we connected on the, on the meditation side of things. You know, that's been uh, just a, a a practice in itself ongoing and you know ebbs and flows like we we're talking about uh but i think that's it's a good way to kind of summarize where i'm at that's that's the story of how my life got uh <laughs> got a bit upside down how do i say <laughs> Yeah, because there's yeah. a lot of. Uh, I feel like after um I started using psychedelic, there's a lot of deconstruction. So it's not even like whatever you were before. Your life starts from there, and a lot of like taking mm. away stuff that we thought we were, and layers and layers. And I think meditation does the same thing. Not coincidentally, mm. I feel like both of them walk together because to integrate most of our psychedelic experiences, like, wow. And you started with Mother Ayahuasca and 5MO. You were like, no, 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 let me not try mushrooms or LSD. Let me just dive into <laughs> DMT. <laughs> let me get out of this room. Yeah. And yeah. So how was those there, there, there experiences? The, um, it was in the, the same ceremony, the same day. So we had the uh, ceremony at same day um on sundown we started the ceremony for for aya and then uh, went through the night had that experience and then sunrise we had the ceremony for uh the uh, dmt so um it was you know med same with meditation these are tools to look inward right they're tools to as you said deconstruct and and to you know ask questions from maybe a different perspective you know good way to internalize you know why we're here what we're doing uh and ask the the kind of bigger questions because we a lot of times in those experiences we realize well it's not just us there's the collective as well and so it spawns a different type of um as you said new beginning and for me it certainly was 
Yeah, and also uh, we think that we're going to go into psychedelics to do internal work. And when we see we're doing work for the collective, it's like, oh, it was all a trap. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, the, yeah, right. right. The, the the main thing that uh especially for 5MO, I'm very curious to know like what actually happened in the experience. I can talk a little bit about mine too, but you really you I think it was the first time in before having my my experience with 5MO, I had the realization that like oh this reality is not really real, right? It's not physical. But after 5MO, it was like, yeah, the I should go within because this is a dream and having the, mm. that experience, I still, and, and it wasn't like uh, in the experience, it was like, after I had the experience, like just reality just became very raw. And I remember putting gas in my car and thinking when I leave my room, my place, my place ceases to exist. I need to be there witnessing for my room to exist. And I remember mm -hmm. whenever I would smoke weed, it would bring me right back to that uh, nothingness mm -hmm. like only I exist and I would look in, in the houses I would yeah. walk at night smoking and it would like kind of everything is made out of plastic and even my visual mm -hmm. field like I remember when I would smoke weed like my room would would look like a like a like a funnel like it was like a you know when you draw perspective <laughs> right. I, I would see like that yeah. and and I feel like that really even though I had tried many psychedelics before, it was the first time that my reality was shaken and I was like, okay, there, there is something here. And I feel like I'm still integrating that insight in my life. And this was like three, four years ago that I did 5ML. So I, I would be curious to hear a little about your experience. Wow. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the 5ML DMT uh, was... I mean, it just shatters reality. Uh, you know, we, a lot of people talk about full ego death, and uh, I just it it's beyond that a bit. I mean, I remember the experience pretty vividly, still, and it, you know, it's four years ago. Uh, and the way I kind of describe it is, if you were to imagine looking at reality in like the the first you know, one megapixel iPhone camera or whatever, right? The experience, uh, and it's real zoomed in. So it's uh, low resolution and taking something like 5MEO DMT is a huge zoom out and high resolution. It's like a, a trillion megapixel camera looking at the universe in a way. And I just remember the experience of that zooming out and experiencing what I can only define as uh, if you like the, the infinite, right? It's, it's even now it's kind of difficult to describe, but if you were to experience infinity, something that never ends, right? So nothing that's really born or, 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 or dies that was it. And I felt the expansiveness of it and was completely integrated into it. And the experience also was this, this movement of, you know, vivid color and, and, and then, and it was, um, I don't, it, don't remember a lot of specifics. I just know the feeling of that. And then waking up and, uh, you know, them kind of bringing me back and, I was like, what happened? <laughs> and they're like, oh, you were, you were crying like the, the whole time. And the whole time was like a, a couple of minutes, right? But to me, felt like an eternity. And uh, it just provided a lot of clarity uh, and took, took me kind of out of the equation. Like you realize that we're, we're, these, we're these small lifetimes here but we're part of this infinite consciousness as well. So it was, it was just a wild experience. And uh, it's hard to imagine, you know, going back to having the same perspectives before that. Um, and it may be intellectually, but now there's more of a, a knowing underneath that all. And like you were saying earlier, 
about um, like doing work on the collective's behalf. It's kind of similar because we know that we're we're infinite con consciousness beings having an experience on this earth, but we're having it together. And it's, you know, we came here to be part of something, not just to identify our our individual selves. Although that is the process. And the more we do that simultaneously, uh, the more we realize how we are part of this. So I'm looking forward to doing it again and, and experiencing something similar or completely different. What was like, I feel like men are usually more rational. <clears throat> how were your spiritual beliefs or like, did you believe in God before? And how was that deconstruction? Because especially for men, I feel like you have the need to control, right? So you thought, and then suddenly you, you, you realize that you are this little insignificant thing in this vastness and, and like, wow, we're all connected. And in this, I feel like it's an encounter with God. Not that you encounter someone, but you realize that you are creating the whole thing, right? It's You are part of this huge consciousness. So how was it for you to get out of the rational and integrate this into your normal reality and even interact with people? Because after those experiences, like when we talk, people are like, oh, okay, she's off. She's off the deep end and she, she's not going to come back. But for me as a woman, maybe it's more like I especially being more emotional, like in being in spirituality for a long time, people were not like, wow, what are you talking about? But I had difficulty integrating back into reality. So I imagine how men with their rational mind, how is this process? It's an interesting question because, you know, looking back on it, I was probably already somewhat irrational. <laughs> um, I wasn't tied to uh, the religious archetypes and attachment. You know, I, I already had a very you know deep understanding of, uh, my own spirituality and what I found to be more truth than the kind of narrow vision religion had to offer me. And during that that same time, you know, it spawned a lot of uh, deeper insights into the you know, esoteric and the spiritual nature of things. And I know you've talked about like Ram Dass and Alan Watts and, you know, um, characters of, of that sort. And you know, I, I dove really into the, the deep end um, ar uh, around the same time before, during and after that experience. And uh, it was really integral to be open, kind of, you know, having an open minded skepticism about a lot of the, the teachings, you know, and and even to today, I would say I, I have the same kind of philosophy, although you know, it's it's becoming more difficult, I think, to sift through a lot of the, um, call it the, uh, the dysfunctional part of spirituality, like the ego, ego, spiritual ego, you know, that kind of accompanies a lot of the communities uh, we, we see around. And, you know, that's okay. Uh, not my thing. But going back to your original question, I, I didn't have a lot to really hold on to. So it wasn't that big of a break for me. And maybe I don't maybe I don't really prescribe to the the that male archetype a, as much. Um, I feel like I can hold and balance uh, multiple archetypes and not just the, you know, the, the masculine and, and male dominant one that we have in our culture today. Um, so it was a lot easier for me. Uh, I asked that because for me, psychedelics in general, not only 5MO, it was very uh, impactful because I had my religious upbringing. So God was the ex explanation for everything. So like God, like God would, would answer everything. The Bible would explain in details everything how reality works Aiden and Eve that's how the world was born and blah 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 right. and I see that when I moved to the United States everyone here was an atheist they had a science <laughs> as a religion and it, it was the big bang and if we can prove if we can quantify that's and I feel right. like um, 
we're raised in either one of those, right? Unless you had parents, you had luck to have parents that were already open-minded, but we have a framework that that's where we start life from. Mine was re religion and that was very hard for me to deconstruct. And it was even harder to get into psychedelics and have my whole reality just shattered and like, okay, God doesn't exist. I need to go after something else. And for a while I was an atheist and it was the darkest phase mm. of my life. And then after I became spiritual and then and now I'm something else, like it just passing all those phases. And like I said, the spiritual people, they do have, it's like a religion too. Like oh, spiritual people mm. need to dress in a certain way. They need to speak in a certain way. They need to, to act. They need to be loving. And like, there are many masks that we, we, it's, it, those are beliefs, yeah. right? It's like a scaffolding to build a, a building. You cannot, to change the building, you need to have the scaffolding. And for me, it was religion growing up. And then for a while, it was an was a, a, atheism and then uh, science a little bit too science explains everything and then now it's like seeing that it's not between choosing each one of those like all of them have their place and how to integrate all of that and not cling to one of them so that's why i ask how was your upbringing <laughs> i uh my family was like protestant methodist uh and i went to a catholic high school I had some uh, Jewish influences growing growing up too, or in my twenties. And all I could say is, I mean, I got in a decent amount of trouble in high school uh, uh, because of my belief system, and it boiled down to me just, you know, qu questioning everything you know, questioning the religious aspects, even when I was a child, even through through high school. That, that's and... it, that when we're a child, we are curious. It's maintaining that curiosity and keeping it alive. Yeah. That's difficult. And then we are, we're grown with the label of rebel. But no, we are just, we still have the curiosity of a child that we just didn't let it die. <laughs> yeah, well, to me, it's really important. It, it really encompasses it's a major tenet in in how i operate today just staying curious uh because uh, you know i feel like if if the curiosity were to slide it it's usually slides into belief systems right and then and then once that happens and once belief systems get a hold of, of you it's it, they're more difficult to loosen and for our own evolution uh, I think, you know, having varying perspectives, questioning everything, you know, being open-minded but skeptical and and balanced, uh, curiosity really flourishes. And and what is curiosity? Just a, a kind of a quest for knowledge and information. And, you know, we use our experience to, de to decipher and to you know, make sense of the world around us. And for a lot of people, it's, you know, a, a one way road through religion and that's okay and there's a lot of good goodness that comes out of that and my grandfather was one of them he was very religious and you know trusted in in jesus and trusted in that jesus would provide and he was also a really good human and led by example so he didn't just believe he practiced in those teachings as well and and it worked out for him i mean he was uh, an amazing human being and led a great life and and so, you know, but he, he still had that attachment less so because it was a practice too, I think. And uh, I think my practice is that curiosity and, and to, in this conversation, understand your perspective because it's going to influence me no matter what, just, I, I get to decide on how, how much. And, you know, I, I find you know, other people's perspectives super fascinating because they're not my own and I have a lot to learn and an infinite amount of things to learn too. And and that that can also be a trap uh, because if we stop learning from our own experience and just learning from others, you know, there's, there's, there's you know, ego steps in a lot of times as well. But I think finding the right balance of curiosity um is is important now now more than ever I, th I think a lot of people stop short of really getting to understanding of of another 
Yeah, I feel like the disability, when I think about what we're talking about, it's like trying psychedelics is basically creating an anchor and a center within ourselves. Because once you get all those perspectives, the religious one, the science, the spirituality, and then you see that like, oh, I don't need to pick one, but I need to have a ground to step on. Like I need to walk through life with certain principles. And and then you go within mm -hmm. because we realize, I don't know about you, but I realize after all those years trying psychedelics that it's not outside. The answers are not out there. I can read the books. I can have many perspectives as I want, but in the end, I need to be guided by my center and myself. And some people find that through religion or some through science and through spirituality, but I feel like it's a, it's a quest. Like it's an invitation. I, I always say that, that when I try psychedelics, when, before trying psychedelics, I am, I came to United States, I did backpacking in South America, and I went to Argentina, and and then my first year here, I'm like Mexico, Belize, Guatemala, and going everywhere. I love traveling, mm -hmm. and then I realized that I love traveling because I wanted to get to know new perspectives, new ways of, of, mm -hmm. uh, of seeing the world. And then after I started right. trying psychedelics, I stopped traveling because for me, it's like, yeah, I have a whole continent to explore within myself. I don't need to be traveling all the time so I can travel within myself. Yeah. And it's like, uh, I feel like before I was living externally and then after psychedelics, I start going within myself and traveling internally and exploring my own mind because it's like it's exploring the, the own mind. It's limitless. Like you can go wherever you want and you can explore the universe within yourself it's like finding god yeah. it's like finding god within and i feel like um it took me a long time to realize that that i didn't have need to have um even the ayahuasca church that i was a member of for me i was like oh because i'm a member of this thing i'm a good person and i'm i'm being guided mm -hmm. or i have delight in my life and after i was removed from the church i, I didn't tell you this i was removed from the church because i do other psychedelics and it's okay it's their rules but i had to go find the light within me and see that everything about me was divine i need i didn't i think probably because of my religious upbringing i think i thought that i needed to have a place and i love the community it was very difficult to be removed because i felt like it was like breaking up with a lot of people at the same time like i used to go through right. those very transformational experiences with those people and i'm not gonna have them in my life anymore and even like the whole uh, kind of blackmailing that happened um with the members of the church that I was not going to be in the light anymore if I didn't belong to the church and, and mm -hmm. repeating to myself, the light is within you, wherever you go, you are sacred. It doesn't matter what you do. So I had to look for, for the center within myself. And what I find uh, in this journey of, uh, with psychedelics is that if you don't have the center, you're off you're an easy prey to ideologies or you need because the ego needs to cling to something to survive right, right? and if we don't find the center right. within ourselves it's going to be a cult or the church or science or whatever we find <laughs> what a yeah what a journey too and, and to finally realize that you don't need to really travel to find yourself you know to to look within and you've You've got all the answers. It's religion, not all. I, I mean, what happens I, I see frequently is that people give their power away to religious figures. You know, and science is a religious religion too. And, you know, when people give away their own power, they lose a lot of that sovereignty and start looking for answers elsewhere because the question or the curiosity to find it within is no longer an option or less of one and it does create a lot of problems right and i i think we i think it just it just we see a lot of that in society today um i can't say that i've ever been lost like that i think I think I, I have the opposite attachment style to get uh, attached to a religion. I have more of a a standoffness mm -hmm. to uh, to that than anything else. But what did you find when you when when you when you first realized that the journey was internal? What was the first thing you learned, or what was the first like aha moment? 
Do you remember? Actually, if, if I think it wasn't even psychedelics, because, because before psychedelics, I did a Vipassana retreat and I'm, I was mm. getting to meditation. I'm like, I was all naive <laughs> thinking that I was just going to meditate and be all quiet for 10 days, right? In silent meditation. Right. And I got out of that retreat crazy crazy i remember calling my <laughs> no i remember because my mind inside because it was the first time that i was bored my whole life we couldn't mm. have phones there we couldn't have a book we couldn't even stretch so like what am i supposed to do huh? like with my mind and it was right when i came uh, well it, it had been a year around a year that i had moved here to the united states so imagine that I was very conservative in Brazil. I had their religious upbringing and I had my identity that I presented to my family and my friends in Brazil. And then I came to the United States and like, I don't know who I am because everything that I was, it was what my parents wanted me to do, right? They, they wanted me to be mm. in a certain way and I was just being the good girl and being that person. And then I go to this meditation retreat and my mind is wild. I'm thinking about everything. I'm thinking about like, sex and I'm thinking about what I'm gonna do and and like I'm just raw it's the first time that I let boredom take over and boredom is where creativity flourishes right and my mind was just like wow there's so much to experience I wanted to ride motorcycles I wanted to do everything and and then I remember getting out of this 10 days that I was just and I had an enlightenment experience there so I was right. I was meditating was like the most difficult day. I think it was the seventh day and I'm like the fuck, I'm just going to get out of this place. My car is here. I just drive off and it's okay. I did seven days. And that day I had, um, it was my only, I think, mystical experience through meditation. That is not like through really? psychedelics. And I remember that I just loved everything and everyone. And I loved the ground. And I, I thought about people that I hated and I loved those people, them. And, and I was just sitting there. The meditation ended and I just stayed there in that state. And I'm like, wow, that it, that it was like life changing. And when I left there, I called my sister and even like holding my phone, it was weird. I remember going on Instagram and seeing people posting selfies and I'm like, wow, those are like monkeys. Like, what are those people doing? I do that too. <laughs> and and then I remember calling my sister and she's like, um, you just did a 10 days meditation. Why aren't you calm? Like, what is this excitement? Like, be calm. Like, you're supposed to be like Buddha. Why are you all over the place? Right. And I remember that I left Vipassana retreat, like, wanting to live life, knowing that, like, there's more to explore. And I feel like all my, my not all of them, right, but most of my religious and, like, my old self, whatever was hanging on in that e first year that I was here, it was just like peeling, peeling the onion. And I started discovering yeah. myself. That's, that's how I became crazy. And I, I like when people call me crazy because for me, it's a compliment, like being normal in this reality. It's like, yeah, yeah, I am crazy. I feel like the crazy nowadays is the normal. Uh, so it yeah. then doing psychedelics, mm. but it was meditation that well, like I threw me off the cliff. <laughs> I love that. Um, I have, I have a friend who did a 10 day, med, you know, silent retreat and he loved it. You know, he had a, he had a profound experience too, but kind of the opposite way of yours. He found some clarity and calmness. And, um, I mean, I could do it. I, I just don't think I, I really have a desire to, uh, but, uh, you know, I think it was Alan Watts who said, yeah, meditation is a great uh, what do you say? It's a great uh, way to waste time or something to the effect, you know, it's like you, you think about it. You're just sitting still. You're not doing anything. You're not going out experiencing life. You're not, you know, and that that's what the point I tried to make earlier is it's like we came here to experience, you know, ourselves in this, right, with each other. And, you know, sitting in meditation for hours on end is great i guess but you know the whole world is happening simultaneously so you know um it's kind of why for me meditation fluctuates I'll, I'll be great about it for a couple weeks uh, you know just it'll be part of my routine I'll, I'll ceremonialize it um, and then i'll do a week not even not even thinking about it and just living life you know um I can't say that I've had a a profound experience meditating, but I I have had some difficult experiences meditating. 
in um in LA there's the um Lake Shrine. It's uh this meditation center. Have you been? Actually, yeah. I do. I was just gonna talk about that. I lived with a nun for three years. I think when we met, I was living with her, and she's a devotee of, of Yogananda. And she said it's oh, wow. very like she had just gotten out of a seven hour meditation, and she's like to sit there and to meditate, it's very easy. Difficult, it's to go outside. And then I went to walk my dog and the near neighbors started yelling at me. That's difficult. Life is difficult. To meditate, it's easy peasy. And so I know Lake Shrine. She worked at Lake Shrine. Yeah. <laughs> oh, really? Well, mm -hmm. I did one of those meditations. I used to go like on, on Sundays and do the, the long ones. And, you know, you're there for a few hours. And the first you know, three or four times, it was... I, it was probably one of the most difficult things I've ever done, you know, sitting there doing nothing. And, it, you know, the body, you're just start, you're so uncomfortable, you're moving around and, and, you know, it's, it's like, wait, this supposed to be meditation. Like, what is this? But I, I kept going and it took a few more times. And I was like, oh, well, this is not so bad. I could do this. You know, it was like three, four hours. And uh, it, it just, went by like that and i've I found that pretty i haven't i haven't done it since but it was pretty interesting to to like be there with myself and my body and my mind just racing and this is like the you know the the, the universal problem for for people who seek answers in meditation it's like you know a lot of people will say well you didn't have time to to meditate for 10 minutes today do it for 20 you know mm -hmm. it's like yes but also you know you can also do a meditation for one minute you know it, it's kind of there's a little bit of ego involved when there's like a timer set and there's like this expectation you put on yourself i, I have to do 20 minutes a day every day so like, hey, you're missing the point then kind of you know, yeah, you, life you can... is a meditation, right? That's the goal of meditation is to bring. Right. Yeah, at least for me, what bring helps. That outward. Me, yeah, what helps me the most yeah. is I feel like meditation slows time down, so I can it slows down time. Yeah, so I can see things more clearly because I bring that calmness and, and I feel like you know when you do exercise like you're running a marathon or whatever, and there's a point that you reach that it's very difficult. Your whole body's like, and then once you pass that there's like an opening, mm -hmm. an expansion that happens. That's the same thing with yeah. meditation. So when you sit and there, there's like that pain and that boredom. So once you, it's like a wall. And once you cross that, that there's something that opens up. And um, mm -hmm. I think it, it, that's why it's very difficult. And as a society, we're not used to, to meditate and to stay still and to be bored. But um, yeah, I yeah, feel right. like that's where the magic is. <laughs> it is. And it's pushing past this discomfort in a society and culture where we do everything we can to be comfortable mm -hmm. and the slightest discomfort throws us off, you know, so that, uh, that lady who's a devotee, so easy meditating because you're, you get to a point where you're comfortable, but then you go outside and, you know, walking the dog and the neighbors and, you know, it introduces you being uncomfortable it's not so easy but uh, life's about being uncomfortable and finding the comfort in it you know the med the practice of meditation is, is to do that so once you've kind of reached that point like in the marathon example and you're you can do meditation for days straight well maybe you don't really need to do that anymore you need to find discomfort somewhere else and challenge yourself and, and and put yourself out there for a different experience because that different experience is going to bring different learning you know i've i i just realized um i i've i've done a lot of learning <laughs> uh being being uncomfortable unlearning right? oh i've done a lot of unlearning a lot, a lot <laughs> of learning, you like yeah. for example with that Medi because medi if we think in terms of uh, scientifically speaking, what meditation does is the same as psychedelic does, right? They've put the like the the 
measure the brain of of monks to see what's happening and a psychedelic experience is very similar i remember once that i did a microdose and i had this experience at work like i had done the microdose i went to work it was not a high dose i just felt like that stillness like that that mm -hmm. feeling of like how oh, everything is in peace even though it's chaotic it's in peace and i had this woman coming to me and like oh i, I worked in in a structural engineering uh office and she started yelling at me she's like my plans they're not ready the seat is not responding and she just started yelling at me and at that time i looked in her eyes and everything i saw was a child I'm like, mm -hmm. she's a child. She needs attention. And 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 then I sat with her. I'm like, no, it's okay. We're gonna we're gonna fix it. And she's just yelling at me. And if it was a normal day, I would yell too, because I have the Latina in me. <laughs> like I would yell at yeah, her place. Out, right? And then after she left, my coworkers were like, How did you maintain such a calm state <laughs> while the lady mm -hmm. like walked all over you? And meditation does the same thing, like because meditation if, if for me at least not every every person experiences differently but for me it helps me define the boundaries where where is me and where's the other and it helps me identify like everything people do it's about them there's nothing to do with me this lady yelling it was her inner child or whatever her behavior is about her there's nothing to do with my worthiness yeah. and me as a person and at that time I knew how to separate and I feel like meditation also helped me to go back within myself and be like oh that's you that's that relates right. to you and that relates to the other person and um not but not always psychedelics is going to bring that calmness sometimes it's going to bring more chaos mm -hmm. for us to realize more stuff. So it's going to bring more mess so we can mm -hmm. actually make the change, right? So it's not always, but it's, I meditation yeah. and psychedelics is the Pandora box. You never know what's going to come. That's the reality. It's true. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah, it's true. I, 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 I didn't know. And if you were to know, it wouldn't mean the same thing, you know, um, and what, what they say is like, God doesn't put anything in front of you that you can't handle or rise above and i i agree and even, you know it's hard to say for for some because you know people go through some extreme circumstances and experiences but you know uh i was just gonna just thinking about that experience when you see the the inner child through someone who's acting out i mean what you what you did by receiving that in the way that you did is very healing very very healing for that other person you know so the the practice that you've learned through meditation uh and and, and psychedelics as well that the practice that you just kind of from what i perceive you do day to day and you're doing now through through listening and perceiving and just accepting where people are at you know but also Except i didn't know the woman there's this part too if it was someone close okay. to me and they start saying words that i would get offended then it would be something else so don't see me as a saint <laughs> well well but it that's that's like that's exactly what it is the, like to offer that uh, as a service to someone you don't know is very saintly that's like like that's their practice is to to offer that healing to complete strangers. And because ultimately we know that they're not, just because they're a complete stranger, we don't, may not know them by name or have experienced them before, doesn't mean that they're, uh, you know, outside of mm -hmm. our capability to be present with them, mm -hmm. you know, and, and to, to offer that healing. And, and, you know, some people won't take it, some people do. Some people don't even know that they do. Uh, and but I, I still think it's it's good practice and it's really good work. And I'm sure you you find yourself in a lot of those situations because you're a healer. Well, I what but that's what I said. My ego would get attacked if she was someone that I knew and that I have it in my life. If it was my family, for example, then it would be something else. Maybe I would not have that same level of chill <laughs> that I had with that woman. Uh, this this week I posted a quote on my Instagram talking. Uh, it was Matt Khan. He was saying that uh, when people are yelling at us and fighting, we are watching them fight with themselves. So there's nothing to do with us. 
And, and I feel like right. through the work of, of Metcon, I learned a lot to separate like what is mine and what's other people. But most of the time, like, especially if I'm PMSing, I fall into the trap of like, okay, they're <laughs> offending me. And, and, it, but it's a whole process because what is, <clears throat> what is this healing that you talk about? It's not that I'm helping the other person. I'm witnessing them heal themselves to go through the process. Yeah. That's what I do. Even as a couple, People think that like, oh, we helped each other heal. No, you were there with the person sitting by their side or while they went through their shit. So it's not like yeah. we're doing or we're saving them, we're helping them. You are just making company. Like I'm here while you go through yeah. this whole thing that you're going through. And that's what we do as humans. But it's so difficult to not interfere with the process or to not take it personal because it's basically an animal that is wounded, Right. If mm -hmm. the animal is wounded and you are going to poke the animal, the animal is going to bite you. If it's a dog, a dog is hurt and you are <laughs> going to poke the dogs around. And as humans, we forget that we're all full of wounds in the society and everyone is around, like just waiting to attack. Yeah. And we forget that everyone yeah. has, has wounds and there's nothing to do with us. And we have our own. And then sometimes when people poke us, we think that, it's because of that person that thing is coming up. No, it's already in us. It's the wound that it's in our body. There's nothing. The person only showed us where the wound is. It exposed, but it doesn't have to do anything with that person. And I feel like that's a journey of a lifetime to realize that there's nothing about other people. It's the, I think that's what 5MEO showed me. It's all about me. It's my journey. And and in the end, it's a collective work because everything that I do, even when I, like the, the nun helped me with that too. She, I remember she, we had a third roommate there. It was like a monastery, her place, like would meditate all the time and like vegan food and like all blessed by Yogananda and Yogananda was everywhere. Like it was like a monastery. And I remember we yeah. had this uh, third roommate and she would never clean up after, after herself. And it got to, and it got to a point where I'm no nun, okay. So I sat with the nun and I'm like, hey Laurie, listen, I can't take it anymore. She doesn't clean after herself. I keep washing her dishes. And then she sat with me and she's like, Laisa, when I wash her dishes, I am not doing it for her. I'm doing it for God. And that, that <laughs> broke me. And I'm like, wow. So like, it's, yeah, you are serving God. You are not serving the other person. It's about you. It's uh, I'm having the opportunity to serve myself. What is God? Yeah. Uh, right. So I'm having the opportunity to serve myself. And of course, we don't need to be doormats. But like we, right. we need to talk to her many times. It didn't fix. So are we going to live in unhappiness? No, let's just do God's work. Right. And that helped me a lot in, in, in life because I have very open heart. People take advantage of me. But in the end, like I'm not I'm not doing transactional stuff. I do because I have it in my heart to give. Right. Some people mm. don't have. It's OK that you don't have. You cannot wash, wash your dishes, clean up after her, yourself because you don't have it in you. And it's so difficult for us to, to see that. And sometimes we're empty, too, and we don't have to give. And some other person yesterday, I was thinking that how much love is important, <laughs> like how much this reality is like the, the glue that holds everything together is the few people that have love in their heart and they're there when mm. people need it. And it's. It's so rare because we're self-absorbed. And I, I talk for myself, like many times I'm in my own internal process and I take everything personal. I think it's all about me and I need to be like, it's not about me. Like even recording these videos, it's not every day that I'm, I'm, I'm feeling good, but I need to think that it's not for me that I'm doing, right? It's for, for the collective. And yeah. in the end, it is for me too. I'm serving myself when I serve the whole, but yeah, it's, it's a whole journey. And it all comes down to love, self-love, mostly. Yeah, for sure. And it's so easy to to forget because I, we only have like our own experience to go off of. It's not like we can easily jump into another suit, someone else and have their experience. You know, it's walking in someone else's shoes is really difficult. Uh, and, but, you know, having those healthy boundaries totally essential can't be a doormat like you said uh but it, it it takes practice it takes it takes self love to have that uh, autonomy and and sovereignty to protect yourself from from that from energies that don't serve you as well a lot of the spiritual uh ego comes from you know well love and light and you know even though you 
you just totally disrespected me. I'm, you know, not going to take care of myself and I'm just going to let that, let it go. And then you get, you know, take advantage of. And, and so it's really difficult to, to, to be in that position and to, to kind of take yourself out of it a little bit, not completely, but like to understand the dynamic and to look at it from multiple perspectives and to, to join those pers perspectives together to make a decision and, and then move with that decision, you know? And I'm really glad you brought up Matt Kahn because you're the one that introduced me to Matt. Oh, no way. And I'll never it. forget, like you sent, you sent me a, a Matt video on my drive to Sedona. Um, <clears throat> and I must've listened to, it, to him for like six or seven straight hours. And uh you know he, he he talks he talks a lot about the you know boundaries as well but also something that that came up is is also saying thank you you know to to someone who may be difficult or may be projecting and it's like you know those powerful words saying saying thank you thank you for reminding me because of whatever is happening on your end that I can act on my own without you affecting me. And, and thank you for, for providing me more of a, a remembrance that I can, I can be autonomous and I can make a decision uh, in my best interest. You know, uh, there's a lot that, that was super helpful at that time. So, and I, I still listen to Matt. I'm so happy for him and uh, Joy. What a, what an awesome uh right awesome I mean, yeah. so, I, so I, something that I li I listen to him very frequently it's I feel like it's him and and Leo Guda from actualize.org it's like Matt Khan is the heart and Leo is the brain so I've been listening to those two guys for almost 10 years and um this week I was listening about the video that he talks about taking the high road like even mm. when people do their dirty thing, you you still on the high road because you don't want to get dirty. Like it's about your mm -hmm. relationship with yourself. Because I feel like yeah. in a world, like even if you see war, ah, he hit you. No, I, I hit him back. No, I'm going to hit him back harder. And it's like two children, five-year-old playing and fighting. And like, can we be the adults here now? Can we be mature? Do we have the capacity to see that we're killing each other and soon none of us are, are going to exist. So like, can we be the big person and take the high road and be like, hey, you are there. It's okay. They're there. We don't need to be there with them when they're, when they're in the low road. We don't need to be there. We don't need to. Because I feel like as a person who follows the path of the heart, I take on a lot. And actually I end up attracting more of those people because what they want is love. So they are starving for love. And because mm -hmm. of that, they see me as an easy prey for them to transmute their darkness. So like yeah. wherever I can, I can put this on and the good hearted people are the ones that can transmute their darkness. So good hearted people end up attracting very evil people because that's how they, they, they cannot process themselves, their own darkness. So they cling on to good hearted people as a, um, yeah, that's right. Not even a, a survival thing. Like I need to go on with life and I have a lot of darkness in me and who can take it? Like, and, and that's, it's such a difficult path to, to be in my heart and have my heart broken over and over and over and still take the high road. And like, can I still be the big person here? And especially with yeah. my family, I with my my friends, I'm awesome. Just to apologize, to say I love you. Now with my family, that's where the main work is. Like, can mm -hmm. be as love? Can I be as loving as I am with my friends, as supportive when it's my family? Because the family, I feel, I feel like it, the more time passes, the more our ego uh, solidifies, right? right? And that's that's where. Mm -hmm. it, the work is most difficult because there's so much deconstruction to to have there. Like my family has always seen me as this person that is kind of rude. And sometimes it's the language in the family. Like my family always yelled and we don't say loving things to each other. So like, can I be the first person? And it's a practice that takes so long. Like now that I start saying, I love you in the end of the call. And it's like those little things and sometimes just listening because I don't need to say my opinion, right? And right. It's, <laughs> it's a whole journey. But Matt Kana has helped me so much to to realize that 
everything I'm doing is worth. Like the, there, there is a reason to be, and in the end it's about me. I have the capacity to have my heart open because I know that that's my only way that I'm going to not even reach enlightenment, but I have peace in my life. It's not going down to their level and treating them because I also have my inner child. And, and I feel like he helped me a lot to be there for my inner child so you wouldn't run the show. So whenever I see that I'm going off the path and I listen to Matt Cunning, he brings the love back to my heart and a lot of self-love of course like most of, of his but for people too because people are desperate for love nowadays and no one talks about it the hung, uh, like the the book from uh gabor mate the in the land of hang, hang, hungry ghosts yeah that's okay. the name of his book everyone oh, cool. like desperate for love but we don't know how to ask for it and mm. we have the most exquisite ways of asking for love as humans yeah we really do and i think it get love gets conflated with a lot of other things as well you know attention sex um you know there are a lot of dysfunctional aspects to relationship that gets intertwined with that unnecessarily but you know, like family is super triggering right we can record a whole thing just talking about the family part. The family yeah <laughs> and then you have your chosen family who, you know, uh, have a balanced relationship with. And, you know, I, I've done a lot of healing with, with my own family, uh, specifically my parents. And yeah, it was uh, uh, growing up, it was chaos and dysfunctional. And I guess around the same time, uh, yeah, around the same time, you know, circa 2020, I, I I said, I'm not going to have any more of that. And uh, I'm going to, I'm a, it may, maybe it'll hurt, but I'm going to put my heart out there and uh, repair and heal these relationships because family matters. And it, it matters to me a great deal. And it's been a lot of work, you know, but a uh, completely different relationship I have with my parents now. And <clears throat> took a lot of practice to like understand where they're coming from and and to see them as just human beings as maybe not parents but just as like two adults that have had their own experience have had a lot of you know ups and downs and and just to have maybe it's empathy maybe it's compassion but uh whatever it was i was able to uh really shift a, a new gear and look at them way differently and it's made uh, a, a huge difference in in it all and we're much more open we talk about everything we talk about real stuff not just the weather you know you show up on christmas and it's it's like oh how's work you know it's like i don't you know we could talk about work but we could also talk about like real stuff you know we can go a, a few layers deep let's get to depth and and meaning and ultimately understanding about you know how we feel about being on this shiny blue ball spinning <laughs> so fast in the vast emptiness you know like like um, there's just so much to talk about it's but i feel like it's um it's a lot, of, a lot of vulnerability that is required for us to present ourselves as a new person to our parents because they created that image of us and to break that image and to take the load of the deconstruction and their reaction of who we are now. It's a whole process. I haven't seen my parents in, in almost 10 years, so they don't know me. It's like I'm a stranger for them and and them for me. Like hearing you talk, it's like how much I want to talk to my parents about profound stuff that I talk about but I've never spoke to them because it's this deconstruction that it's very difficult and opening the heart to to like well, and getting all the baggage right the traumas and like they're human beings like us trying to figure out life and yeah. they didn't have yeah. support in the stuff that like the whole self-help junkie right. journey that we went through they didn't have that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so it didn't and and like to in a big part like we're probably here to to heal a lot of that, and and it, it, it's it's tough too because just because we can and are are uh, we have the heart space to do that doesn't mean it's our job either. Um, I think it's a lot of leading by example, and and being vulnerable. 
means a couple of different things. It's like you, you you're you're vulnerable because you're exposed and you're open to pain, mm -hmm. but also it, it maybe being vulnerable, um, maybe not to your parents, but being vulnerable outwardly gives them an opportunity to be vulnerable as well. So um there's a lot of different ways to 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 teach our parents <laughs> if we want to do that, you know. That starts with us, but, reparenting ourselves. Yeah, right, right. And it's it's harder to, you know, it's like, you know, do as I say, not as I do. It's like that paradigm is is over. Uh that's that's our parents' stuff. And uh it's very much lead by example, but it's what are we leading with? And the and you know, and what are we breaking right to the patterns what are we breaking here yeah right and that's the main part like what is the habit that we have that i'm breaking like it's, it ends with me i've yeah. said that many times it ends with me i'm not bringing that into my family <laughs> like that's yeah. and let me introduce them to a new way of being too and it, exactly it's much resistance from their side too because they're familiar to their old ways and like it's it's a whole journey <laughs> Yeah, you're right. And it brings up conflict and you're just, you know, susceptible to it. And the, the vulnerability there, you know, sometimes it, it hurts and it's going to be painful and it's a long process. You know, the healing doesn't happen overnight, especially with fa family dynamics. And you have siblings too. And that like, that just makes things more complicated, you know, because the way they raised you is not the way they raised their, you know, your, your sister and, you know, uh, but in uh, something that you, know, you said that, that really you said putting your heart out there and knowing that you were vulnerable and you were probably gonna get hurt that's that's yeah. life summarized in a couple quotes yeah. <laughs> otherwise what's the what's the alternative you know you're you're, you're that's maybe maturity play that's maturity like if i yeah. want to connect deeper with someone i need to open my heart and i'm once it's open i'm gonna like anything can happen hurt or or mm. love or pain or whatever pleasure and exactly and and it it takes that i don't want to call it degree of consciousness and awareness to be present to that because it is kind of a choice and you want to make those choice con choices consciously because if you don't you know there's it's a much steeper learning curve like if you're not aware of these decisions why you make them or why you're being vulnerable you know, the, the pattern tends to repeat itself. It's like, okay, well, I'm done with this pattern. I've learned the lesson. Give me the next one. Uh, it, and you're, you're, you're ha in c communication with that vulnerable aspect. Um, then, you know, ho hopefully th things change and, and you are open to uh, new lessons, but it, it takes a, it takes a lot of awareness to even talk internally about that. And and to talk internally about it from the perspective of like uh, like I could be wrong, you know I like I'm not a hundred percent I'm not a hundred percent certain this is it, but I'm willing to experiment, and that's what life is. It's just a long chain of experiments. <laughs> and I feel you know? like once like the realization of the patterns is something like you realize it, right? You become conscious of it. It's something else to integrate it, to walk the talk. Like, oh, I realize that. And it's like, it opens a little window of like, oh, I see this pattern with my family. And then it closes. And then you don't know when it's going to open again, but you need to, to take the momentum once it opens up for me, like, oh, let me actually work on that and he, it, it needs to have a desire for the person like mm -hmm. not like my relationship with my parents it needs something inside them needs to open up to i cannot just do do it my way right so it's like both yeah. need to be open to it and in the level of the heart <laughs> because especially with family i feel like there's so much that happens in the mind about like all the memories and oh, stuff yeah. like in the level right. of the heart what's happening here it's it's mm -hmm. the journey of uh, like they say that the longest journey that we're gonna go on it's the journey from our mind to our heart. Right? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, that's, right. I'm lost somewhere in between them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, I mean, I wouldn't say you're lost, but I, I it is certainly a journey. Walking the path. <laughs> yeah, walking the path. Uh -huh. And yeah, 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 it's a fun one. I wanted to talk a little bit about the polarities of masculine and feminine before we go 
into AI and then we close up with AI because I know that's going to get crazy and we don't know where we're going to go from there. <laughs> yeah. Even what we're talking now, I feel like this ability of having my heart open is very feminine, but because I cannot be a doormat, I need to bring my masculine side to like to, yeah. to be the, the, the one organizing everything that is going on. Like you cannot just keep opening your heart like you need to protect yourself and then and there is I feel like I'm in a point where there is no self-love without my masculine being healthy like without bringing my masculine and integrating my masculine healthy masculine, yeah, there, right yeah the balance again you know I've, I'm trying to understand or at least get uh, deep in my understanding of the polarities and how they how they interact together within myself and i guess i've had a lot of experience uh with uh the the masculine side obviously because i'm a, a man but beyond <laughs> that uh being in the in the Marine Corps was uh you know hyper masculine. Oh yeah. All right. All so, <laughs> yeah, and and not not necessarily the sacred type of masculine or masculinity either. Uh very much macho, you know, alpha types and faux alpha types. Um, you know, so those main archetypes are very much at play uh during you know the my 20s and but it also you know, it brings a lot of structure to looking back now right to the good side a lot of structure a lot of structure right. this self-discipline and self-discipline at, at the cost of individuality because you know we, we yeah. very much lose our identity to be part of this collective because we have a collective mission and mission first so you know unpacking you know who I who am I as an individual after the fact has been challenging, but also, you know, my, my curiosity has been been very helpful in that. Uh, but from a, a, a masculine aspect, uh, also understanding, you know, what is what is what is it to balance the feminine side? Because ultimately, I think it's the responsibility of the masculine, and especially the sacred masculine, to hold space for the feminine. Right, the feminine yeah. really is like uh, chaos. Right, it's like it's like the ocean. There's been a lot of similarities and 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 uh, speakings in the esoteric about or yin and yang about uh, the feminine being more than the chaos aspect, and then the the masculine is the structure that can hold it in place. And the the purpose be behind that is creation. Right, if you want to talk about the the trinity as a religious aspect it's the uh, ultimately it's the the mother father child as the the trinity um it's been also related to as the mother father and spirit but for the purpose of creation right and uh, that, that creation is the the feminine's responsibility in in part but she's the creator you women bring life and in, in, into into this place so uh but but from the masculine side it's about protecting that and and creating that safe space so to to balance that internally for my own creations and all my own purpose here and i i don't like saying that word but takes that balancing act uh really creating the the container for myself to create in and uh, I wouldn't say that uh, if you want to learn that, join the Marine Corps. Uh, but <laughs> you know, there's there's uh, probably some other uh, methods to to go about that. But it was good to to learn from an extreme, and then to unpack it, as opposed to if I didn't do that, kind of sit in the middle and experiment on, um, you know, who knows where that would have taken me. Because I think for men, it's so important to have the sense of purpose. Like, I feel like men nowadays, like, they don't even know what they're protecting. Like, in my they're mostly protecting themselves nowadays. A yeah. lot of men. Well, it could be the, 
their own hearts. So they're like their whole life is to protect their own life and their ego. And and like when yeah. you go into the the military, it's like now I have a purpose. Now I have something to fight for because men do have this ma the masculine, the healthy masculine. It is like I can kill, right? But I'm gonna use this strength to protect. Like I don't need to just go and kill. And and I feel like the military gives a lot of men who don't go to the military. They need to find something else to fight for in their life. And because mm -hmm. nowadays they are just like the the whole uh, the polarity of the feminine and the masculine that happens within ourselves, all of us, right? For us to be able to um, express this outwardly. We need to first mm. go within ourselves and see where, like for you, for example, when you left the military, it was probably like, what the fuck do I do now? What do I protect? Like, what is my sense of purpose? Like I have this whole team and I would die for my team. And now what do I die for? Like, what what am I yeah. doing now? Like, what am I protecting? I, I feel like, uh, I don't even know. Maybe you can talk a, a, a little about that because I mostly work with women like one on one, my sessions are mostly with women. My courses had some men, but like my main work is with the feminine because I'm very heart centered. But I don't know for men like nowadays, it's so much about achieving and money and and status mm -hmm. and that like I don't even know if it comes to their mind like what am I doing here as a man? I need to protect. What am I protecting? What is the feminine, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and all those those things to strive for money and status they're, they're not necessarily bad things right it's just the they're uh, more often ego driven but i mean you give a man a simple purpose and he'll have a fulfilled life and it could be something really small you know it doesn't it doesn't take much for for men to to like once they have purpose to be happy you know and and i, I think What's interesting about the, the the balance, though, is that in spirituality, we try to harmonize the balance between the masculine and feminine, because ultimately, we see that as, or the spiritual community see it as this, this the, the, we uh, break down the polarity game to become one that, you know, you to be one with, you know, uh, universe or unity or God. Right. So, um, which, is, which is great from a philosophical standpoint. Um, and, and maybe from a, a, a spiritual standpoint, but, you know, I'll, what I see happening a lot is that men or women push away their own, uh, masculine or, or feminine to focus on, on the unity aspect and, and which is, which is great, but we also live here on, on earth, you know, we're, we haven't ascended yet. Like, that's why we're here. We're here to have this experience in this body. And, um, you know, so I see there's, a, there's some things that get kind of conflated and, and there's this desire going back to, uh, um, like a psychedelics as a tool to become one to drop this illusion that we're we're in this polarity game it's like but we came to play this game you know uh so I, when i do sessions with with men especially it, it's like getting to this realization that one you're an individual uh and and two maybe you, you don't have a purpose now but purpose is very loaded right it's like, oh my gosh, what's my purpose? And, you know, life coaches and coaches, and we try to get to the, uh, you know, students to that point, but it's, it's loaded and it's way different for everyone. Um, but for, for men, it, it, it it's kind of simplified when we have this internal mechanism we try to understand about ourselves and we honor the differences that we have, including our own masculinity uh, and try to unpack that, try to understand who we are, and then we can kind of go into balancing uh, the polarities. Because the balancing effect is really a, also a tool to to do something, right? Tools are meant to like build something or or fix things, and a lot of times there it, it to, the balancing effect is to heal either uh, our mother aspect or archetype that has caused trauma or the father archetype that has caused trauma. Um, 
but I don't, I don't know if it's entirely desirable to live in that balance all the time. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. A lot to unpack there. I think um, the first, it, it, even if you're a man or a woman, the first thing that has to happen is the desire to know yourself, to know who mm -hmm. you are, to go within yourself, to go on this journey yeah. that you've been on for, for a long time of like, what do I like? Who am I as a person? What do I value? Where am I going? And I feel like as like things are so messed up nowadays, and I I feel like big part is because we women also we we for me it's also like when when can I be masculine? When should I be feminine? When should I open my heart? When should I close my heart? So like this whole journey of like what the fuck's happening here? Where how should I be? Because society requires me to to be one way. Like the game of life requires me to close myself, to be more masculine. But at the same time, I feel good when I'm in my feminine. So it's like things are so inverted. And I feel like that's mm -hmm. where the problem is. Because women, like like you said, we give life, right? We, as yeah. women, if we don't nurture, like it's like a plant. We can let the plant die. Or we can nurture and nourish the plant. And the plant's going to grow and, and, and thrive. We decide what gets to live and what gets to die. Even like when, when we raise a man, we get to choose if they grow or they're going to die. Wherever we put our attention grows or shrinks or disappears, dies. And right now things are so inverted as, as women not being able to be in our feminine and, and, and realize our power here, right? Because the feminine sets the frequency men love mm -hmm. to serve and to protect and to provide right. but for that we need to give them something to fight for like what what are they doing so it's kind of like they say that the woman is the the neck right the, the man is the head and the woman is, is the neck like where where are we going and us as because it's easy for i feel like a big part of my of my journey like no because men are macho men are these men are that without looking at myself like what am i doing where am i guiding the man that I'm with and like, where am I going in, in my own life? And, mm -hmm. and also because of society is the way it is like questioning myself, should I actually be in my heart or should I be more in my mind? Like, so it's this, and it's the dance of duality. There is no answers here. So like, it's just like the <laughs> polarity, like we are in a world that there is duality and it's difficult because there's always one or another one. It's like the dance between the two. So we're never going to be only one. But I feel like uh, as a woman, I can say that I blame men for a lot of things. And I'm in a point of like, no, I need to take ownership about my my journey and what I'm here for, what I'm responsible. And it's it's a daily it's a daily thing that I need to remind myself to be more in my heart. And even men, too, because if you think there is um, the feminine within the man to guide him, like the intuition, the connection with right. the heart, that men are disconnected nowadays because we're in a society that values rationality, logic, and uh, achieving and mm. success and, and money and fame and blah, blah, blah. So they're not really connecting to the, the feminine because there is no reward to connect to their own hearts. But then we see the world that we're yeah. in, and it's kind of a little messy, right? Because we, we like the polarity within and not even the polarity. It's just like, as a man, you need to connect with your heart. Eventually you cannot just run away your whole life. And as woman, we yeah. also need to learn in the masculine way. Like we cannot just be in our heart. Like me, I see myself crying many times and sometimes I need to get together. Yesterday I was talking to my sister. My other sister was in the hospital and then she's like, but I feel so sad. And she started crying. And she's like, I feel so sad she's there, but herself and I I took her out of the, the the emotional roller coaster because it's so easy for me to go in the roller coaster and I'm like she's okay she's gonna be fine we're gonna call her tomorrow morning because I I see myself diving into the emotion and I'm like it's not bringing me anywhere in trying to so in the end it is this balance within ourselves that we can name feminine masculine mind or heart or whatever but in the end it's like how do I balance myself as a human being so I can feel good right and not only be pulled to what society expects of me or life like whatever life throws you you go yeah yeah, uh, that coherence, you know, mind, heart coherence is definitely a, a practice too. And yeah, duality. So 
so interesting. I I think it's such a because I I've been deep into practice of my own intuition and I I couldn't see a more valuable trait than being able to listen and to to sharpen it, your someone you know intuition because that's like the guiding force that's like your your gut like telling you which way to move like that's you know so powerful and yet so feminine right and you know how far do we really get on logic and anyway mm -hmm. like it gets you so far but but then you know um it's not the the whole truth which is why i appreciate appreciate the duality so much because because they both need each other yeah there's so much uh, to offer the other as well if it's received if it's honored you know let alone i mean at the very least respected and you know it, in a time where it's so difficult to respect each other's differences <laughs> you know, True. for some reason it's like <laughs> you don't think the way that i do if you don't look the way that i do um you know you're you're, you're the other or yeah you know it's we're, we're, we're at a point at where it's easier to look at what we have in common than our differences because the difference keeps growing because that's god expressing itself he wants to live as a black person as a white person as a yellow person and he wants to be a man or woman and 10 more genders that we have nowadays and it's like it's just god expressing itself in all different ways and if we keep mm -hmm. going towards what what are the differences we're not going to get anywhere but if we see that we're all humans trying to figure out life and trying to express the energy that we came here to express through authenticity right uh, yeah it's so it's it's the only way just seeing our similarity instead of like okay that's another human even though they're totally different than me it's another human it's part of me and that that's a, yeah, it, of a, a lifetime it's so easy to i i just i don't know why it's so difficult to appreciate someone's differences i i, I mean because like... to accept people different people's difference, we need to change ourselves. And we are very comfortable where we're at. The ego likes familiarity, family familiarity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And likes yeah. to be the same and likes to be comfortable. So embracing people's difference is gonna make us different in a way. The one that is perceiving it's gonna be changed by the, the yeah. experience too so we don't we don't really want to change so the the more equal people around us are the better it is so they just confirm it, uh, con confirm like whatever we think and we stay in this little bubble the other part is that's god consciousness right knowing that we're all those crazy people around us <laughs> it's just so it's so boring though too and and how do you fight change like change is the only constant and yeah, it's just it's it's difficult to like you know see we're at a time where we ha have been withdrawn inward, like inward to like a um a position of uh separating ourselves, right? Not not being um uh inviting or understanding of of someone else. Quite the opposite and. There's this. I'm not gonna blame religion, but um, there's there's this uh, quote, I forgot who is by, um, but it's um, we're we we're never more separated from each other than when we are when when we are on Sunday mornings, referring to we each go to our separate church, and we close the door. We lock each other out and we're with our own people. And it's like, well, your your neighbor is not there, maybe going to a different church or something. So how like inclusive is that? Like how why do we why do we constantly try to separate ourselves? You know? Um and I think consciousness and psychedelics is a way to do introduce the opposite to that.
you know, so just going back to original, but uh, it, it, uh, it's pretty much commonplace now, right? Coming full circle with psychedelics. <laughs> we yeah, because it, 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 it's just let's it, it's throw so... AI into the mix. What is AI doing? Well, AI is God. Yeah, God which is... itself. Look, it's just this big data, yeah. like a lot of data from everywhere. All the history, all the people talking, mm. it's all there in this brain, this huge brain. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a really um like if we're God, what would you do? AI, right? If you were God, if you were playing God, <laughs> what would you do? AI? Yeah, I think it'd be a fun experiment to put humans through, you know, have them create this uh, big brain um, that, you know, it's a, it really just, a, it's a, and I don't even want to call it a brain because our brains are way more complex and intricate and special than, and than this AI system that we have now. It's hardly AI. It's really a catalog of, you know, uh, of information that cleverly puts together things in, in strings that make sense to us. But ultimately it's really just, uh, it's just why I have uh, a hesitation of it is because imagine taking the average of something of everything and then, um, uh, and then asking the average a question that we do on chat GPT and other LLMs is that, well, you're going to get an average response you know, depending on the person getting... using it. And then there yeah, yeah, like yeah, for sure. the psychedelics, the person behind the psychedelics. So how do you use the tool? Yeah. Yeah. You, I mean, there is a lot of training. You can definitely, uh, definitely train it in a way to get exactly what you're looking for or, or to seek an answer that would be much more difficult if you were to try to figure it out on your own. And that's what I think is why is such a great tool uh, because it, it has the capability to do things. And I saw, I saw a post the other day about AI. It was like, AI would be really helpful if it figured out how to do my dishes and mow the lawn. I saw that. Uh -huh. versus, versus AI was supposed to do art, my dishes. My yeah. AI yeah. is supposed to do my dishes and, and, uh, do my my homework and or my work or whatever so i can focus on my passion not the opposite yeah. right and that's, that's the opposite. yeah or, at the same or time I'm, um i'm very optimistic somehow with the <laughs> with the the future because i feel like everything that exists it's perfection it couldn't hap happen any other way if it's happening right now this way it's like people that complain about capitalism oh, capitalism is a, it's what's happening right now if it could happen any other way it would have but somehow it's what's happening right now so it's the best that the best option that could happen according to our level of consciousness and um, mm -hmm. AI, I feel like it's an it's, it's also everything that exists is an expression of God. So the same way that a knife can be used to cut food and feed a whole family, it can be used to kill people. So it's like yeah. the most important part is not AI, it's the humans, right? Who's using it? And and what are we creating? <laughs> it's this beast yeah. that we just I... let off the leash. And like, <laughs> <laughs> it is so exciting Trouble. to think about it <laughs> because I feel like it can be used for good too. Yeah, I I totally agree. Look, I I'm optimistic as well. Mm -hmm. I think it I think it has the capacity to be a tool. That... Who's gonna play the devil's advocate here? If we're both on, yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> I'll take the uh, pessimistic <laughs> point of view. Look, uh, it I actually I don't know if I can really, um, but you're right. Like the the downside of that the of the knife analogy, or is <laughs> the fact that it has the capacity to create great harm and i think that's why there's like these safety commissions which is good we should be talking about it's like safety. an atomic bomb we do have atomic bombs and it can be on yeah it led on like anytime everything can explode but somehow we're handling <laughs> I, I think the I, here we go i think that the downside mm -hmm. is it makes humanity dumber than it already is um, because humanity, if we rely on that as information, what do we really learn? Um, and then also if AI does become sentient, um, you know, there's certain dangers with that. Uh, not really like the 
you know, the post-apocalyptic views, you know, where it takes over like in the matrix or something, but which is possible. But I, I mean, it, if we are so reliant, it's like any technology. We're, if we become so reliant on it without understanding it and having respect for it, uh, it ends up biting us in the ass, like the atomic bomb. We haven't used sure, it it's since. It's like raising a child. No. You raise, you can raise a little monster. It's raising a yeah. child. How do we nurture this child? Do you do you just keep putting information, or do you put some love and you? Like, yeah, and how do you explain it? Mm -hmm. How do you like? You know what happened with the the Google? Because the people, like? it's interesting. No, uh, uh, the people using right. There are more people now that are more intellectual and in their mind than in their heart. So like, can the people also? And that's why I say the spiritual people need to have the same thirst that evil people have. Like, oh, you are like work your soul, throw yourself in the arena, let's do some good work because right. and learn these tools. Yeah, so, yeah. Good. How do we teach it? How do we teach AI? matters of the heart right it's, it's really good how do we how do we how do we teach it intuition how do we teach it these things that are human that can really benefit us besides you know being being able to look up information to serve us in that moment you know um you know once once we start learning from it what were you saying before I, ryan remember. that i cut you off um i i don't remember i i think you mean the is it in the dangers of AI? Yeah, you were finishing the dangers. I just think I just think it's a the it's dangerous when we don't have respect for it, mm -hmm. and, and we don't really respect ourselves to be able to respect AI. Right. <laughs> and then and then who's and who's <laughs> teaching it as well, right? What information are we censoring from it, and what information are we feeding it, and how are we? How are we describing that information as in w which way is useful and, and not like, how do you provide context to an AI system? And it, um, you know, for, for, to understand the, the nuances of human nature and human nature present day. The truth is that nature... we don't, we don't really know ourselves to be able to. Yeah. And, and not only that is, is that, if you were to take a, a snapshot in time 50 years ago or 100 years ago it's different like we're mm -hmm. we're different and and so how do you how do you information has been collected for a long time so how how do how do you know which who's really talking mm -hmm. in that because it's an expression of us but it, it's also so here it is it's like an AI system is very two-dimensional, right? But humanity is three-dimensional. So how do we express ourselves over time uh, or through time and then also through different cultures, right? Because, I mean, just just look in the last 100, 200 years. Uh, I mean, it's just so vastly different. How do you describe how it's changed here in the United States and then not some other places or how things have diverged elsewhere you know so um i think it's challenging and I, I think if we don't accept the challenge and respect it, it a lot of things can go wrong well the way that i see it's uh ai it's going to depend on our consciousness right it's going to depend on where we're at because we're the ones using the tool we're the ones playing with the children playing with fire and um, Matt Khan has a video that he, like, it's such a shocking video. He talks about the three levels of consciousness, like the two, three waves of ascension. So like the first wave are uh -huh. the people that are now, they're integrating, they're more in the heart. Like what, it, what is the, I don't even like to talk about that because very kind of woo woo, but he says like the fifth dimension, right? Entering the fifth dimension, the third dimension that you said that, that uh, humans are very 3D. It's the mind. And 5D is the heart. So it's like this mm -hmm. journey to go uh, from the third dimension to the fifth dimension. And the fourth mm -hmm. dimension is time. So like mm -hmm. it's the time that we take to get from the, the third dimension to the fifth dimension. And mm -hmm. 
are we going to be able to and, and then he said the first wave of ascension is people that are already super connected to their heart the second wave of ascension it's people that are like going from the the mind to the heart. descending it's a process it's not ascension it's we're descending to our bodies <laughs> our soul is right. entering in our bodies that's that's what he says mm -hmm. and um from going to the, the second wave of ascensions, people that are going towards the heart and like they are in this journey. And the third wave of ascension, it's people who got lost into technology. He calls it tech zombies. Are people that are, they're so being, being so sucked by their, their phone that they already right. disconnect. It's not even about the heart or the mind or whatever. They're just being sucked by whatever is being presented to them because we have a lot of distractions and we are addicted to our phones. So like there are those waves of ascension. And the first time that I heard this video, I'm like, well, what the fuck? Like I'm very much in it <laughs> a lot of the time. So I feel like it, it's going to depend on our level of consciousness. Like, are we going to be able to catch up with the heart and have better principles and morals and see that the way that we're living it's not really sustainable in the long run if we're thinking about our future descendants right if we're just living for ourselves whatever let me just enjoy this life but what about people that are coming after me can i think uh, like there's a quote that says people who actually uh, get it are the people that are planting trees that they're not going to seed on the shade right. of the tree right. so it's like can yeah. we and to have this mentality is god consciousness is realizing that we're all connected we're connected to all the shitty people that we know and they're a part of us that are he that are they're also healing so it's like it, we're all one and this mm -hmm. way of thinking it's being in the heart knowing that we're oneness and we're not alone we're all one alone the name alone we're all, we are in um epidemic of loneliness nowadays we're so isolated we've never been so isolated with so many cases of depression anxiety ADHD, and all the sort because we're feeling lonely this technology gives us a sense of connection but we're not really connected like we have so many yeah. followers but like sometimes we don't have a friend to go for coffee so it's just this how we're living our lives and are we going to be able to catch up with the heart i don't know but i i think it all depends on on who is using the AI? The same with psychedelics. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm hopeful because I feel like we're going to be able to turn things around. AI and psychedelics, take, like yesterday I was watching something. It's like, you know, those things on TV that they ask a question, who was the president of blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I mm -hmm. don't know. I need my phone for that. My phone is like <laughs> an extension of my brain. I don't know those stuff. Right. If I don't go on Google. And uh, <clears throat> I feel like the genius... Oh, it's gonna find the the AI, and if you're, we really good people learn how to use AI, we can do good work. Like we can catch up, but who knows what's gonna? Yeah, I look. I'm optimistic too. I I see a lot of goodness coming, and and maybe there's the perspective of, you know, um, AI bringing in a lot of, a lot of good means that it'll also bring in a lot of bad you know so you know the 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 light and the dark tend to uh uh balance out so the greater the light the greater the dark and the, there's going to be a shadow aspect of this where you know we're we're just on the edge now we're, we're coming into it but i think we have such the uh, capacity and I, and I hope that it becomes a tool for us to be more connected unlike social media where you know, it kind of kind of dropped the social aspect for the media, mm -hmm. which is fine, you know, but we, you know, imagine waking up one day 20 years from now as a Gen Z or being born in this and realizing, oh man, in my Instagram, I spent 20,000 hours, on, you know, on in X amount of years or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's like, it's not insignificant mm -hmm. and we're on to something the... with technology especially what? work with technology we are on to something like the way that like being in our phones all the time we are on to something there's like a bigger thing happening that we don't even know of yeah to well totally I, I i think it you know does a lot of things to our brain it it um we we get those hits of uh uh, hormones, you know, when we're, do yeah, dopamine and serotonin, they're short lasting because they're, it's not, it's not like a true connection. Like 
Mm-hmm. This, we get the same hits from uh, meaningful conversations, but they're longer lasting, they'll last for hours, mm-hmm. right? And so how do we convert? I mean, we've only had social media really, and where it really kicked off was 2013 when it just hockey stick. Uh, yeah, 10 years. And so we're still learning about the, the downsides. And when policymakers are calling for an epidemic of loneliness, you know, it's problematic. It's like, what are we really going to do about it? How are we going to hold these organizations responsible? But also, what else are we doing? Who else is building something that is better? Mm-hmm. We're living in the best age. Like, it, the world has never yeah. been so much fun and interesting and fascinating so right now. Yeah, I agree. It's chaos. But... Add psychedelics into it. Add AI. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, we're having fun. Yeah. We're having a good life. <laughs> I mean, look, I, I'm having. Can fun. we die? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, it's also <laughs> part of life. Yeah, it's part of life. It's something we don't talk about nearly as much as a as a culture, or at least in the in the states, we don't. But um, you know, it's necessary. It's part of life. It's going to happen. Just bringing to the light, right? Talking about it, it's already. Yeah. Well, because if if we do, then what happens is we talk about. Well, what do we do with the time that we do have? Are we on Instagram as much when we realize like, you know, we only And also, are you creating something or you're just consuming? That's the way way that I see. If I'm there to gather memes or whatever, I'm creating something. So it's something that like I I could not post, like today I didn't post anything, but tomorrow I'm going to post and it's going to have more than a thousand likes. So like I'm creating something. I'm being creative in the process. I'm not just consuming, consuming. Because most of people are just consuming, consuming, consuming. And it's like this, that's why we're anxious. Like all this anxiety, they're just gathering all this information. It's getting stuck in and them like we need to put it out yeah. start to, to create right. stuff and and be a human that's what we are creators we are and i think it's a difficult question to ask someone is like what 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 are you going to create today or what do you create and i think a lot of people struggle with that i certainly do from time to time and uh i can only imagine growing up in this world where you're just a consumer and no wonder it's lonely because all these people you're seeing everyone around you create something but you're just you're the one that's that's not Mm -hmm. which is an untrue statement but it can be perceived that way but it's a big trap 24 7 all the time our life we're creating so it's, like it's it's God mode, like realize that we are creating all the time, even though we're consuming social media at the same time, we're creating all the time, all of us creativity, creativity is not only for artists, we're all doing our own thing, our art, that is our life. Yeah, I think, I think psychedelics has certainly helped me create more, at least let me ask the question of what am I creating with my time here? Mm-hmm. And what am I doing? And how am I? How am I being of service? You know, I I really think that (laughs) that's something that I used to repeat in my in my my practice. How may I be of service? That's but that's transcendence. It's realizing that it's not about us, and a lot of people are not there yet. (laughs) But it's it's a good it's a good practice. Yeah, for all of us. Yeah, that's finished. There's a lot of tools. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And there's a lot of tools to uh, to help with that awareness, right? The, you know, meditation, psychedelics, if, if done. I also safely feel like, like even, sorry to cut you off, like this epidemic of loneliness is because we're self-absorbed, right? We're self-absorbed. Uh, sometimes like I have coaching sessions and I'm not in a, in a good mood. And then I had it, like, it just renews me. It's like, the tr- mm-hmm. or I, or yesterday I recorded a video and like, 600 people already watch it and for me it's like okay like serving we get out of our like i'm gonna finish with this i was watching um a talk with tony robbins and the woman is like uh, i wanted some insights because uh, i have a uh, low self-esteem and i wanted to record videos i wanted to do something i wanted to help humanity but i i'm shy and i have self-esteem issues and blah 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 and he's like um, is it about you or it's about the people that you are serving. Because if it's to help people, you're not going to be lost in your shyness, in your low self-esteem. Like he said, he said, 
you are lost in narcissism. You are self-absorbed. If you really want to help people, there's nothing like, oh, my hair is not good. I'm not, I'm not talking very well. You just do it because it's for to help people. It's not about you. Now if people are getting the, then it's the ego, right? I need to get ready. I need to be perfect. Everything needs to be in place and I need to be ready. I need to be perfect for me to serve. And no, when we get out of our own ways, then stuff and that's dense too because it's not always that i have this mindset right uh, sponsored sure. by mushrooms mushrooms talking to you <laughs> <laughs> I, I get it but uh, yeah a i little, feel like it, that's like is helpful. a really good end uh to finish with that like how may i be of service i think that's what's missing for yeah. us like to get out of our own ways yeah well thank you i appreciate that and and i agree uh, this is a, a lot of fun and we definitely you have some last words. Thing. I don't want to cut you off if you needed to say something. No, no. I, I mean, you, you, you said everything perfectly. That's, that's a, a great, great way to end it. Thank you. Thank you. That was so fascinating. I love this talk. Thank you for your time and for your wisdom. And we're going to do part two. We need to talk more about the AI. <laughs> I yeah, feel like we just sure. scratched the surface. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We can go on for a while, but let's do it again. But thank you so oh Ryan, let me ask you, are you doing work with men right now? Like can I put your Instagram down here for people to find you? Or do you prefer to um, get animals? <laughs> yeah, I'll 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 send it to you. Uh I I'm doing a little bit. I, mm -hmm. I'm I'm I've got a project uh I'll share with you that that's uh can be super helpful, I think. So great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ryan, for your time. I'll see you next time. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. All right. Bye.